是如果说有讲太快或者是什么样的情况，会需要呃我们请请他呃用用口译的方式做，我们也是可以当场再换。那就是现在我们先暂时先用 set 用英文也用英文来讲，然后唐凤文读的方式。好，那如果有什么如果有什么问题的话，可以就是举个手。Thanks a lot. Um, it's really nice to be here, and I'd like to thank everyone uh, who arranged this and who made it possible for me to be in Taiwan. As you heard, it was a bit of an effort, and I really appreciate the effort very much. And thanks to all of you for coming out to hear this presentation uh, and for sitting through a uh, two-hour panel. Uh, it's a lot of patience to uh, just sit here and hear everybody and not get to say anything until much later. Uh, so thank you all very much. And uh, also, I'm sorry to be the only person speaking in English. Uh, I apologize for that. I have not learned Chinese, so thank you for the uh, real-time translation. <laughs> OK. Um, and <laughs> Great. So I've noticed that this is a very eclectic panel because everyone is speaking about a different topic. And um, you know, it's sort of all about technology and freedom, which is something that we all care about and something um, that many of us have worked on for a long time throughout our careers. And that's such a broad topic. There are so many different areas we can talk about. Um, I gave a couple of previous lectures during this trip. I gave one lecture at the Academia Sinica um, about why computer security is hard, talking about why we can't just fix this problem with computer security and why it continues to be difficult. Um, and then we had a lecture about the Certificate Authority uh, project, Let's Encrypt, which I've been working on at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And of course, there are so many other topics that we can talk about, about technology and freedom. Um, one that I was told would be relevant that I think is uh, quite appropriate is this difficulty about de-anonymization and anonymous data, which is related directly to the problem of the health insurance data. And the claim that it's appropriate to publish some kind of information because it's not very sensitive, or because it's not very identifiable, or because it's been de-identified or anonymized. Um, before getting into that, I just wanted to mention one thing since I'm up here. Uh, from the first talk about the um, cell phone location tracking just to make that really concrete for people, because that's an issue that we work on all the time, and an issue that people often find hard to visualize. There's a German politician, and some of you may have seen this visualization. Uh, there's a politician from Germany named Malte Spitz, who took advantage of the German data protection law several years ago. Germany had an interesting combination of two laws at that time. One of them was sort of an anti-privacy law, that said that communications companies need to keep all of the records that they have about each subscriber for six months. One of them was a very pro-privacy law that said if a company knows personal information about you, they have to give it to you if you ask. Mm -hmm. So the combination of these two laws was very interesting because it meant that if people were in Germany, all of their communications-related data was being tracked for six months. and they were entitled to receive a copy. So Malte Spitz said, I want people to see what these companies know about us, especially with regard to this issue of location tracking. And so he hired a lawyer who contacted the telephone company and said, I want all of the data that you have about me. The telephone company gave them a very difficult time. They sort of said, you don't really want that. And they said, yes, we do. And they said, we don't really have to give it to you. And they said, yes, you do. And they uh, <laughs> sort of thought about it. And the, uh, the consequence was very interesting that for the first time, a phone company turned over to a subscriber all of the information that they knew about the subscriber in this sense, about the subscriber's physical location. And of course, they had been keeping this data for a period of six months. 
And so Maltespitz suddenly received, by the way, it's M-A-L-T-E-S-P-I-T-Z, which will help for searching for it. Yeah. That's the, well, not English, but German spelling of the person's name. Um, and so he said, how am I going to understand this and help people understand it? And he approached a newspaper, uh, Die Zeit, in Germany, and said, what do I do with this data? And they had some data visualization specialists who decided to make a public interactive visualization. And he decided that it was important enough that he was willing to give up his own privacy for people to really see what was at stake. And if you look at the article that they produced, it has this interactive visualization. And you can follow him around on Google Maps for six months. And you can see when he takes the train, because his phone is going along the, the railroad track. And you can see when he arrives in a certain station, and where he walks to after that, and where he spent the night. Um, and it makes it very concrete, because people talk about these databases, and talk about this data. And you often don't think, wait, that means you can follow the person around on Google Maps for six months. Um, so I think it's very helpful to have projects like this that make some of these things very personal and very real. And you talk about who spent the night where. You can ask who else spent the night there. Uh, you can ask what are the patterns. Do these patterns change? Who went to this meeting? Who was physically together? And location privacy can take on a very concrete significance. So I just wanted to mention that because it came to mind for me, and I think watching this kind of visualization is very powerful. But I guess I'm going to talk a little bit right now about the um, anonymization issue. This is not an issue that I have researched personally. I've done research in computer security and computer forensics, and the de-anonymization is not an area of my own research, but I found it quite interesting, especially because I met a number of times with a researcher named Arvind Narayanan, whom I'm going to mention a few times. Um, he was then a graduate student at Stanford University, and is now a, a graduate student at, uh, sorry, now a, now a professor at Princeton University. And um, Professor Narayanan is very interested in practical aspects of privacy, like how much privacy is possible, and how much harm is done to privacy by particular data collection or data publication activities. And a lot of his research involved taking real world databases and trying to extract information from them that should not have been possible to extract. And um, he's not the only person who has done this kind of research, but he did a lot of it. And he wrote about it really, really clearly and eloquently and also explained it quite clearly in person. Uh, so this is really a researcher who I think helped improve our understanding and our sensitivity about this. And I'll show you um, one item from his website, and you can go and read dozens of articles that he wrote about this issue, which are quite clear, which present his research or other people's research. Um, but this is a, uh, an academic article from 2009 that talks about this general issue from the legal academic point of view by Paul Ohm. And Paul Ohm had met Arvind Narayanan as well and met some of the other researchers, uh, Latanya Sweeney, some of the other people I'll mention, and they had talked about this problem. And um, Professor Ohm felt that there was a gap because the computer scientists felt that it's really, really hard for something to be anonymous and really easy to accidentally have a possibility of inferring something that should not have been possible, or to violate people's privacy. While the lawyers had a lot of rules that were kind of vague and non-specific and very optimistic, like, oh, if you just don't publish the most sensitive kind of information, then everything will be OK, and privacy won't be harmed. And the computer scientists said, no. Any information can become sensitive in a certain context. And so Professor Ohm wrote this article talking about this research, trying to present it to the legal audience. And I think this article is very valuable. And it's valuable partly because it's very pessimistic. And it's very well informed by some of the computer science research. 
So that's a kind of summary. Um, a lot of this idea in the United States came to people's attention from this article by Latanya Sweeney. And this was a particular um, dramatic demonstration. A lot of the computer science world now likes to have really flashy dramatic demonstrations about how things are broken and what can go wrong. So you see a lot of academic papers that say, oh, we broke this thing, and here's how it fails. Uh, so Dr. Sweeney's paper is uh, similar. OK. Um, so this is a, actually a very analogous situation to the Taiwan case. Um, this is from, I guess the, this research was performed around 2001. And the idea is that uh, certain insurance-related entities received personal health information about individuals as a result of their role providing health insurance. And they, the data were believed to be anonymous, and so they gave a copy of the data to researchers and sold a copy to industry. And what they did, of course, was to have a subset of the data, where it doesn't have the person's name, for example. And at that time, a lot of privacy law and privacy practice in the United States really had this incredibly narrow focus on the concept of personally identifiable information, or PII. And people had this remarkably narrow idea that for each kind of information about a person, either that information is personally identifiable, such as the person's name, or it's not personally identifiable, such as the person's age. Um, and one of the contributions of this research is to show that this very narrow idea of some facts are personally identifiable and some facts are simply not is mistaken. That it depends on context and it depends on what other data sources you have available. Okay. Um, so Dr. Sweeney bought this list of uh, voter re uh, registered voters, which political parties can use to contact people who might vote in an election, which contains demographic information. <coughs> and she was able to link the two databases. The medical data and the voter list had some things in common about the people, and, um, right? Okay. Um, because these facts together tended to uniquely refer to only one person, she could take a celebrity, in this case the governor of the state at that time, and find that person's records in the database, which is very similar to exactly what you just described in the um, Taiwan databases. And so this, uh, this article was published back in 2002, and people said, oh, maybe our notion of personally identifiable information is too narrow. And I just have several other examples about how this became an exciting topic for computer science researchers and also for legal academics to worry about how, in fact, this was quite common that information could become more sensitive than you would first expect. Because you might first think, oh, these facts aren't very sensitive. And then you combine them with other data sets. And in the larger context, you say, oh, but we can recognize individuals in this circumstance. Um, so this is a, a paper that uh, Professor Narayanan wrote while he was a student, and that it's about um, what movies people like. So the company Netflix published this information about people's what movies people like, but without the people's names. Uh, and there was another database of what movies people like from another site that was also available, and the researchers were able to find, with a very, very high statistical confidence, particular people because um, in a way that couldn't be explained by chance. The person in one database and the person in another database have the same opinions about movies. And that people's opinions about movies is not something that was traditionally considered personally identifiable. But they found that it was so unique and so different from person to person that if you had access to it in two different contexts, you could easily recognize people. And that kind of trend was repeated over and over again. Um, this is Professor Narayanan's blog. He's not updating it anymore, but it's great. It has about two years of analysis about privacy and identification issues. Um, 
33 bits of entropy refers to a statistic about the human population of the world. The idea being that to narrow down an individual out of the whole population of Earth, you only need to ask 33 yes or no questions, assuming that each question distinguishes people as much as possible. And then you've narrowed it down to one person. Um, so this was a report on another group's paper um, that said that if you know what block of a city someone lives on and what block of the city the person works on, that that's unique. That typically there's only one such person. This, of course, depends on the demographics of the city. But this could be pretty bad because that wouldn't have been considered personally identifiable information. Uh, then there was this scandal because the information about taxi rides in New York City was released as a result of a government transparency law. And they had specific data about when and where each taxi trip began and ended, and also how much the person paid. And this was released as a public record. And uh, some researchers found that they could identify some celebrities in this data, among other issues, um, that people could be identified if you knew that they arrived by taxi at a certain place. You could go back and look in the database and find out where they came from. And they have some other clever strategies to figure out uh, some of that. Okay. There are a lot of other examples. If you look at uh, Professor Narayanan's blog, over the course of years, he shows that this became a very interesting area for researchers, and they kept showing over and over again, oh, these things feel like they wouldn't be very privacy sensitive, but in the right context or with the right analysis, they can be matched to something else. And so we can't just have this narrow notion of information being anonymized and therefore safe. There is an area of research that tries to address this, um, there are several, but one of the um, most interesting, I think, is called differential privacy, which was developed originally by Cynthia Dwork from Microsoft Research. Um, this is a hard topic to explain, even if you have an hour, and I know I only have one minute. Um, this is an attempt to provide tools that can be used to publish data in a safer way. And one of the ideas is that the questions that can be asked about the data need to be controlled. You don't just put a file up for someone to download. You can allow researchers to ask questions in a limited controlled way. And you can do certain statistical analysis to introduce errors into the data deliberately that will still allow the research to be accurate, but will make it unlikely that individuals can be recognized. That's a big oversimplification. Uh, but there's a whole research field about differential privacy. They have some very interesting results and some very interesting tools. And we were saying earlier, um, talking about this topic, it's, um, it's much more cumbersome than just allowing researchers to download an Excel file or just allowing researchers to download a CSV file with all of the data and sort of take it off to their researcher a corner and do something with it. Uh, because with this kind of tool, you have to think very carefully about what are the specific questions that the research aims to answer. And that has to be sort of disclosed to the people who hold the data. Um, so it's much more cumbersome and much less convenient. But I think there's this trend that we've been seeing in the computer science and information sciences field in the United States that people are saying, oh, this research can have ethical consequences. People are used to medical research having ethical consequences. People are used to some kinds of social science research having ethical consequences if it relates to real people. And there's this trend now where a wider set of researchers are having to say, our research ultimately does relate to real people. And that gives us ethical responsibilities that we have to be careful about, even if we feel like what we study is not real identifiable people. Um, and so I think that even if tools like this are more cumbersome in some way, less convenient, they may become a part of the research landscape as people become more sensitive to the consequences of their research. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, sorry again for the. English thing. Um, <laughs> thanks again for the translation. I hope that it's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
现在有的广告时间，就是。可能可以先。